Hey you, and welcome. My name's Mike, and in this old video... Well, Robert Moan is probably one of the most insane and dangerous people alive. Top 10, at least, in the UK. This story takes us to Scotland, to the year 1967 when things got dark. I'm Dog and Bitch Black. It's a story that begins with Robert Moan walking into a school with a very large brown paper package, and then years later, it's a story of like son, like father. Before we begin, please subscribe to see new stories for the dark every single week. Now, let's give it a go. On November 1st, 1967, and it was a very dark and cold winter's morning, then 19-year-old private Robert Francis Moan whose mind was either going a million miles a minute or was completely blank. He was wearing his British Army uniform and carrying a large brown paper package under his arm, and he was walking into a school. He walked out of the cold, out of the rain, into a girl's classroom in St. John's High School, Dundee, Scotland. Robert himself had attended that school prior to joining the army, but he was expelled in 1964, and his expelling seems to have been the catalyst for what would set off the events of that day. Quite simply, cold, dark revenge. In the classroom that day were 11 girls, all aged between 14 and 15 years old, as well as their teacher, 26-year-old Nanette Hansen, who was pregnant with her first child at that time. Robert Moan was considered AWOL from the army for the past couple of days. A couple of days he had spent drinking himself into oblivion, constant blackheads, one model after another after another. Robert would put his desertion from the British Army down to being shunned and being ignored by other soldiers. See, Robert, against his own judgement, had been persuaded to testify against two officers. An act which, of course, branded him a rat. So, that very stormy and dark morning, Robert, he walked briskly into the classroom and he ordered two of the girls to start stacking furniture and desks against the classroom door so nobody could come in. Not long after, he opened that brown paper package he'd been carrying under his arm, revealing a double barrel shotgun. Then, the headmaster of the school, a couple of other teachers and students who had heard like this ruckus and this shouting and this roaring coming from the classroom, they began to gather outside but were unable to get in because Robert had barricaded the door. Hearing they were outside, Robert started opening up the shotgun at the door. After they had retreated, it was up to Nanette Hansen to try and figure out what the heck to do to try and calm down a madman waving a shotgun around. Nanette actually showed no fear in approaching Robert and managed to calm him down enough to get his demands. His demands? was 18-year-old student nurse Marion Young, who worked in the same school. Now, Robert and Marion, Robert 19, Marion 18, you know, they must have had some kind of relationship. Maybe they were childhood sweethearts, right? Nope. The police who had begun surrounding the school were pretty shocked uh, to find out that they barely knew each other. They had met once months before, had very, very little contact, but apparently that very, very little contact was enough for Robert to become infatuated with her to the point where he was having a hostage situation and wanted her brought in. He was going to take advantage of this momentary spell of power that was given to him by a shotgun. And then seeing the police surrounding the school outside, he began firing shots out the windows. Marion Young was there and she volunteered to go into the classroom to at least try and attempt to calm Robert down and see if, you know, they could de-escalate this entire situation. Now, I'm not exactly sure why the police kind of like, were like, in you guess, but I think it was because Marion was a nurse, so in case there was anybody inside the classroom, any of the kids or the teacher herself were injured, she could go in there and give them medical care. Now, unfortunately, people inside the classroom already did need medical care. While Robert was waiting for Marion to, to come in, he assaulted two of the students in the back of the classroom. In the classroom, Robert, he was, he was pretty chuffed. He was feeling like the big man waving the shotgun around, telling people what to do. He was in charge, and he liked it. Once Marion, though, arrived, you know, she joined Nanette and tried to calm Robert down, saying, you know, it's not too late. You haven't, you know, seriously hurt anybody. You haven't killed anybody yet. And stunning to everybody involved, Nanette and Marion were actually successful in their attempts to, to you know, for, to get Robert to de-escalate de de the situation. He would, ev eventually, he would let all of the girls, the students in the classroom, go. He would let them walk out. 
Once the girls were gone, though, Marion and Nanette then turned their attention to Robert himself, trying to get him to put down the loaded weapon he had. They thought Robert was listening. I mean, he, he agreed to let the students go, and, you know, he's calming down, he's calming down. Put the shotgun down. Just as the women thought Robert was starting to finally see sense, he ordered Nanette, the teacher, to close to close the blinds of the classroom. And when she had turned around, he shot her in the back with the shotgun. Marion sprinted over to Nanette to try and desperately save her life. She begged Robert you know, to let her go so she could get some proper medical care. Robert replied simply, sitting down in the teacher's chair, do what you want. Marion then fled the classroom only to try and save Nanette's life. But in the meantime, the police stormed in. They surrounded Robert as he was sitting at the desk. He was sitting at the desk with like his big sheet and grin on his face. He was having a grand time. Robert Moan was arrested without further incident. But unfortunately, 26-year-old mother-to-be Nanette Hansen, she wouldn't, neither her nor the baby would make it. In 1968, a year after the horrific events at St. John's, Robert was ruled to be unfit to enter a plea at trial due to him being severely schizophrenic. Later, Robert would say, yeah, got away with that one. He conned everybody. Sure, he was, he was totally, you know, in control of his own actions, but he just, you know, wanted an easier sentence. I mean, you know, looking though, what he did in that classroom, eh. He was declared to be legally insane and was remanded into custody at a secure mental ward. Still a prison, though, with even more oversight over the patients. It also comes with an indefinite sentence, which is, you know, no time frame for parole eligibility. So, I mean, I suppose, is it better in prison? No, so this is usually the part where I'd be, you know, finishing off the story, telling you how much I love you. But no, this old one is far from done. Instead of rotting away in a padded cell, far from being able to hurt anyone ever again like a good boy, in 1970, three years after his incarceration, Robert met another inmate named Thomas McCullough. Thomas was just as bad as Robert, if not worse, and had been branded a, quote, incurable psychopath. It turns out Thomas himself, he had been shooked into the secure unit after um, he got into a bit of a dispute with a hotel chef. And when I dispute, dispute, I mean, Thomas shot him and killed him. And the dispute was over not being given enough butter for his bread roll, because he just loves a bit of butter. Apparently he wouldn't give him any more butter, so Thomas pulled out a shooter, shot him in the face, killing him, and then wounded a waitress. Unsurprisingly, Thomas was found to be insane. After they met in the secure mental ward, Robert and Thomas would go on to become fast friends, and also, apparently, lovers. Over the next few years, though, things went quiet and routine kicked in, but little did anybody know, Robert and Thomas were planning something. You see, during his time in a hospital, Robert had constantly been complaining that conditions, conditions, frankly, lads, they're just not good enough. I won't put up with this. I'm not putting up with this at all. When his demands for improvements weren't met, Robert and Thomas said, listen, we're 85,000. So the two men bided their time until they found the right moment to strike. That right moment to strike was on the evening of the 30th of November, 1976, when Robert and Thomas kicked off three hours of chaotic violence by attacking a nurse and fellow prisoner in the secure hospital's social room area. In that room at the time was nursing officer Neil McClellan and another patient, Ian Simpson. Robert sprayed paint thinner into the hospital worker's eyes and then began stabbing him with a pitchfork till he hit the deck. The plan had been to incapacitate the nurse uh, long enough here to steal his keys and so make their escape. So while Robert was doing this, attacking the nurse, Thomas had grabbed an axe from the garden shed and began hacking at another prisoner in the mental ward. He would go book wild on the only other witness. Once Thomas and Robert had subdued the two people in the hospital's social room, Thomas pushed Robert out the door and said, keep a look at it. Then Thomas, about to follow him outside, did the one more thing. You know, in the same manner you might when you're about to leave your house and you forget your wallet, he took up the axe again, went over to the two men lying defenseless on the floor, butchered them with the axe. The two men managed to scale a wall using a rope ladder they had fashioned in the weeks leading up to the escape, even climbing through barbed wire to flee captivity and the hospital grounds. Now this was in a pretty remote area, so to get away, they would need a car. 
but they had already taught her this. Over the wall and running for the nearest road, they set a trap. Roberts was lying down on the middle of the road, pretending he was injured, while Thomas, wearing a nurse's uniform he had stolen with a fake beard, even was hiding nearby. Two cars drove by. The first was a civilian car, and that just, not my problem. The second car to drive by was a police officer's car, which immediately pulled over, seeing this man injured lying on the road, and two cops got out. One of the officers immediately ran over to Robert to see what the hell was going on and if he, if he was okay. At which point Robert grabbed him and began attacking him, while Thomas, who was hiding behind, jumped down top of the other officer. Thomas, with that axe, began hacking at one of the officers, while Robert whipped out a cleaver and began slicing at the other. One of the officers, Constable George Taylor, was brutally murdered there on the spot, his head caved in by Thomas McCullough. The other would survive, but with like life-training injuries. And amazingly, the alarm at the hospital hadn't even been raised yet. No one was aware they had make a, made a break for it. Two men lay dead inside, another one lay dead outside, and another dying. And Robert and Thomas got into the police car and began booking it, emptying the gas tank as they sped away. However, this being in November, the roads were icy, and neither of them had driven a car in a long time. Dumbasses quickly crashed the fucking thing. But then, a van driving in the opposite direction saw this, this crashed police car. The van pulled over, two men got out, see if they could, they could help out. Thomas then decided to be a police officer, escorting his prisoner, Robert. And then, once again, as soon as they felt like they were in an advantageous position, they just jumped on top of the two men who had been in the van, launching just a frenzied attack until they were incapacitated, and then they threw the two men into the back of the van, while Robert and Thomas got in the front of the van, once again driving away. However, after driving a short while, Thomas became incredibly paranoid. He assumed, you know, that they would be discovered, that the alarm had been raised back at the hospital. Pro tip, it hadn't been yet. And so he turned the van to drive off-road through, through the grass and the fields, where it eventually became bogged down and stuck in the mud. And so, once again, that to abandon their escape vehicle. They left the, the hostages inside. They were both critically injured, but would survive. And their escapees took off on foot across the fields. They set off for the nearest building, which was an occupied farmhouse, breaking in the door and terrorizing the family who were inside. Eventually, Thomas demanded, give me your keys. They uh, quickly did, as you would, and they set off on their third escape vehicle. By this time, though, the bodies back at the hospital had been discovered, and so police in southern Scotland and in northern England were put on high alert and began booking it towards this general area. It had only been three hours, but those three hours were absolutely insane. Eventually, the police spotted the vehicle Thomas and Robert had stolen, racing down the road, and so the police cars, there was like a minor police chase, with eventually them ramming, boxing it in, and pushing it off the road. Despite what must have been a jarring crash, Robert and Thomas immediately fled the wrecked getaway car, but were intercepted by several officers. What followed was a ferocious fight between the unarmed officers and the tooled up criminals. In the end though, the persistence of the, of the police officers won out. They managed to subdue both Robert and Thomas. Even when they were cuffed, lying on the ground, head in the mud, they still were giving it socks. Not, they were not going to go down easy, and they didn't go down easy. But go down, they did. In the aftermath, it became very, very obvious that the two men had been planning this for absolute months. They were extremely well prepared. They not only had axes and improvised knives, they had fake IDs, uniforms, hats they had stolen and been tucking away for months in the hospital. They'd simply been biding their time, and, and Thomas was seen as like the mastermind of this entire entire event. And speaking of Thomas, you know, when they discovered that they had all these items with them and were super well prepared to make a prison break, well, the police were shocked at that. They were even more shocked when they were searching Thomas, and in his pocket, they found an ear. When he'd been back at the hospital and the two men were defenseless on the floor, the other inmate, he had sliced off his ear, kept it as a trophy. When he didn't want anybody to hear about their escape, he took that literally. Robert and Thomas would appear in court, and in a landmark case, they would be ordered to serve the rest of their lives in prisons. Separate prisons. 
Though the ruling wouldn't last, more on that in a bit, at the time this was the harshest penalty like served ever. Now you think with all of that carnage, him going into a school with a shotgun and then having this ins insane prison break, that would be the last time you'd hear of Robert Moan? Not quite. Just wait, there is more. Two years after the chaotic and murderous rampage, the name Robert Moan would be once again all over the front pages of Scottish newspapers. Though on this occasion there would be a slight twist in the tale. On the 29th of December 1978, no one had heard from Agnes Wow, the 78-year-old great-aunt of Robert Francis Moan. No one had heard from her in a while. So in her hometown of Dundee, the police began searching for her. And it was like weird from the start. Her front door, the, the front door to her apartment, wide open. The lights were all on and her gas fireplace, it was lit and roared. And so the first place the police searched was her own building. They knocked on all the other apartments in here and then they went downstairs, knocked on the, on the apartment that was direct, directly below Agnes's, knocking to no answer to this apartment either. Being unable to contact the occupier, 70-year-old Jane Simpson, officers forced their way inside. And inside they found both Agnes and Jane brutalized, bloodied, bruised. They looked like they had been horrifically beaten to death and then strangled. They, had, they still had pantyhose around their necks. Searching then the rest of the property, they made another horrific discovery. There was a third woman in the back bedroom. She would later be identified as 29-year-old Catherine Miller, and she was in the very same state as the other two. All three women had been dead for several days. Catherine had been married for just two weeks, and her husband reported her missing after they'd been married for only one week, and now he was identifying her body. Dundee authorities then quickly began one of the biggest manhunts in like local local history in this part. You know, the, the killer was even given the name the Grey Memorial Strangler. They were searching everywhere to cl for clues as to who, who could have done this right around Christmas time. Now, there was a medical examination of the three bodies, and the coroner noted that all three women showed signs of being hit by someone wearing a large and distinctive ring. The ring was so distinctive, and the marks on her body so distinctive, that they could get a clear image of exactly what this ring would have looked like. So the police, they just needed to find the man wearing it. Detectives questioned anyone, as you can imagine, with even the slightest connection to any of the victims, going to every single person. And who would have a slight connection to one of the victims? Well, relative of Agnes Wow, Robert Moan. Now though, this wasn't the Robert Francis Moan who was in prison at the time, it was Robert Francis Moan's dad. Robert Francis Moan Sr. Robert the Elder was better known as Sonny, and known he certainly was. Sonny Moan had a bit of a reputation, you know, kind of around him. He, he had made a reputation long before his son Robert Francis Moan became, you know, a notorious cop killer. Sonny Moan was known for being a drunk and, um, oh, what's the word? <sighs> Complete piece of shit. He was hated by pretty much everybody he ever met. And in the weeks leading up to the murders of Agnes Wow, Jane Simpson, and Catherine Miller, Sonny had been heard boasting in the local pubs in Dundee about his intentions to outdo his son. Sonny was so proud of his son's reputation as, as the Carstairs killer, and he was like enjoying all this, you know, notoriety that it brought him. He was only too happy about it. He was like, yeah, my son is a mad killer. Yeah, it's great. Sonny Moan also had this like big reputation for showing off his own tattoos. He had a IHS tattooed across his, his, his chest, which stood for in his service, the his being the devil. We call that hardcore. It's pretty cringy. But another tattoo he also had was on his, um, you know, TNT. Because it's explosive. Because it never works when you need it to. When he was called in for questioning, Robert Sr. claimed he had been at that apartment, at Jane Simpson's apartment, drinking with Jane and Catherine, uh, drinking there with another guy named Stuart Hutton, but uh, at one point he had to go and get more booze and didn't know anything after that. So if something happened, he wasn't there. However, when detectives went to interview the alleged other guy there, Stuart Hutton, Stuart would say, no, I, I was the one who went to get the booze. And in fact, I ended up going to uh, like a gambling, like a bookies. And I actually never went back. 
Stuart Hutton never went back because he knew how volatile a drunk Sonny Moan could be. Police were able to confirm that Stuart had been at the, the betting shop, and so were on Sonny Moan like flies on shite. Robert Sr. was interviewed for days and days on end. He never admitted anything, but he never denied doing it either because remember, he was pretty chuffed about getting all this attention. He thought he was pretty cool. Hard cool. At one point he even told an officer, I, I put me in, put me in coach, put me in prison. Because you know, he wanted to be there for, he didn't want his son getting all the, the you know, hard man attention. During interviews though, the police noticed Robert did not, w was not, wearing a ring. But when asking around, he did have one. A large silver ring with like a jade stone uh, set inside of it. Ironically enough, it was Robert Francis Moan who had bought his dad that very ring right before he walked into a school with a shotgun. On the 18th of January, 1978, the arrest warrant was issued and Robert Sr. was arrested that same afternoon. In the ultimate irony, Robert was wearing the ring the police had been searching high and low for at the time of the arrest. Trial did not go well for Sonny Moan, although he's probably only too happy about that. He was condemned to life in prison with a minimum of 15 years, but he was not too happy about it. He didn't get to go to the same prison as his son, so poo-poo. In 1983, only three and a half years after a Sonny Moan was sent away, he did actually get out of prison. Only it also turned out to be a life sentence after all. A fellow inmate, Anthony Curry, hadn't taken kindly to Robert's constant boasting of killing three women and had decided he'd quite like Robert to shut up and be dead. Robert Sr. was stabbed to death in prison, uh, butchered, um, I guess is the better way of putting it, by Anthony Curry. Two knives. He went hog wild on Sonny Moan. Couldn't have happened to a better person. When questioned about this, Anthony Curry would say that Robert Sonny Moan was, uh, quote, the most obnoxious person in the country. In 2002, due to the European Human Rights Act, making whole life sentences without parole illegal, Robert and Thomas' sentences were reduced to life with the possibility of parole. In 2007, Robert Francis was given day release. He was out for the day in like this pict picturesque town uh, in the Scottish Highlands. The local folk were none, none too happy about that at all. Later, Robert got into a fight with another inmate, which just cut any chances he would ever have of getting paroled. And that brings us to the end of the story of Robert Moan. Hopefully, the name Robert Moan is a story we will we won't be hearing about again. Sorry to any other Robert Moans out there. I'm sure you're fine. Just you know, don't be scaring anybody. Thomas, despite having killed more people than Moan, actually did win his release. He served his years in a much quieter fashion than his former partner in crime. Robert is still banged up. Nowadays, he spends his time in prison and being 75 years old, it looks like that life sentence will turn out to be just that. And so ends the story, the batshit story of Robert Mo the Robert Moans. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it really does mean the world to me. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this absolutely insane BS story. Um, if you're looking for extra content, please check out the That Chapter Patreon, where it's two bucks a month, you get a early access to all videos and a whole playlist of Patreon-only videos and live streams. You can also check out the That Chapter podcast, which posts every week brand new stories there. I only tell in the podcast. Um, it's a lot of fun, so, so give it a cue. And yeah, until the next video, which will be like in a couple of days, I'll see you then. As always, please look after each other. Please look after yourselves, because I love you. My God.